For those of you who don't know what a rugby brick is, you have built a multi-million dollar business selling plastic rugby tees. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Talk about a niche, right? Anyone who's playing rugby in any of those countries, they're using our products. You've got clients like TikTok, Jay-Z's company, Monster Energy Group. H how did you get TikTok? Yeah, it's a cool story. And so for anyone who thinks about the power of being something that is not useful, they found and came through the website. I hadn't even looked at the app yet. And I yeah. said, you know, we typically suggest some things around UX and changing behavior first for the world's most addictive and fastest growing app. Here's That's our cool. humble opinion. <laughs> Big names and brands have covered your stuff. How do you get an article out into the world and get the attention of media? There's a Facebook group. And I sort of asked in that group, how you got pitched in them? You're still gonna have to do a lot of work because these people are getting pitched day in, day out. There was three things. One, got that outreach directly from the people who listen to the Facebook group. Two, Twitter went through and you're able to pitch and send DMs to journos on there. Third, piece together. What's up guys, welcome to this episode of Unemployable. Today we have a bit of a different story. We have Kale joining us from Los Angeles. He's originally from Dunedin in New Zealand, a small town, and he started a gym in a little town called Cromwell, which was his first attempt at business. The story is that he got $200,000 worth of annual recurring revenue in 14 days from building that gym and then from there, he went on to build a performance marketing agency that has helped the likes of TikTok, Rock Nation, which is Jay-Z's company, and many more, as well as enabled him to take equity in certain brands that come to him that don't have the funds to use his agency, but do need his expertise. And there's a great story in here of a business that, uh, that uh, approached him that sells rugby kicking tees. So those are the plastic tees that you actually kick the footy off when you get a, uh, a shot at goal. And that business, believe it or not, has over 75,000 customers and around $2 million in revenue selling plastic footy tees. It is an incredible story of what it was like when he found that company, how they scaled it, and so much more. And it's a really, really good pod. But you've got to um, let this one cook because Kale is a quietly spoken, polite Kiwi. He doesn't have that overt personality, you know, where he's cracking jokes every five seconds. But if you're patient and you just let this conversation unfold in its own pace, I think you're going to get a lot out of this. So thank you for watching. We appreciate you being here once again. Remember, guys, make sure you subscribe and make sure you drop a comment. Let us know if you're enjoying this content. Give Kale a word of encouragement and thanks for his time on this one. I think you're really going to get a lot out of it. If you're looking for the keys to getting a successful side hustle, this is a really good pod for you. We'll see you on the other side. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of Unemployable. This is a truly international affair today. We have us three here on the Gold Coast. Mark come up from Byron Bay and Eric, obviously here. But we're joined today uh, live from Los Angeles, at least live for us from Los Angeles, with Kyle Panaho. So Kyle is Kyle, sorry, is from uh, Dunedin in New Zealand and uh, or as we like to say, New Zealand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, welcome to the show, Kyle. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you, gents. Appreciate the intro. <laughs> so where about are you? You're in Los Angeles today. Yeah, downtown LA at the moment. So helping my partner, she's got, uh, we've got an apartment here and then the other side of the business is here as well. So, but helping her move back to Aotearoa and getting home to New Zealand. So I'm wow. between the spots and doing a bit of business while I'm here. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Well, we can't wait to dive into it. Mark, how are you, babe? I'm doing well, doing well. Excited to to learn about uh, Kale's businesses here. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting story. Eric, how are you? Yeah, very good. I always uh, always excited to learn more about um, digital marketing and, and the growth and behind how someone has a marketing business and then goes into e-com and and then uses their skills and, and grows that as well in such a niche. I think I think for all you guys listening, this is a really interesting story because Kale, you know, really is the epitome of starting from nothing. His family grew up on the benefits in New Zealand, and he sort of, uh, you know, made his way from that to owning a couple, not one, but uh, I think at least two uh, seven-figure businesses. Um, and you know, it's it's a great story because. You know, New Zealand is such a small place, three and a half million, four million people. Even Australia is a small place relative to the rest of the world. And it shows you that no matter where you come up in the world, whether it's a small town like Dunedin in New Zealand, 
um, you know, with the right uh, training and the right mindset, you can achieve really uh, exciting things. And, and Kale, how old are you now? You're only early 30s, I think I read. Yeah, that's right. 33. 33 years old. So, you know, it's only really 13 years since you've been an adult, really. I don't think you sort of count anything under 20. We're still figuring things out at that point. <laughs> These days, doesn't it start at 30? <laughs> doesn't it start? Yeah, well, maybe it starts at 30. But here you are. You're in yeah, my yeah, yeah, It's definitely under 25 for me, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let, let's get the, the high-level overview, Kale, of what we're going to dive into today. What, how would you describe your story? Where did you start and how did you first get into business? Yeah, so I think the going way back and probably touching on some of the things that you mentioned at the start, as I grew up where you guys are now, so on, uh, I was born in Southport on the Gold Coast and uh, a couple of Kiwi parents and then ended up moving over to a place called Clyde, which is for anyone who's probably knows a little bit about New Zealand, very small, piney rural town, isolated from Brisbane to there at age 10 and then from there ended up attending university, uh, went from high school through down to Otago University, ended up studying and then launched my first business, which was, I guess, a, 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 you know, was more of a, a very, very scrappy uh, throw together a business idea and then see if people stick, which was a gym called Central Fitness in a place called Cromwell. And so that started, I think, God, it looks at 2016. We did that, we kicked that off. And that's really when the first idea of what business was for me, when it's sort of me having a crack and what we did and led to the sort of where our agency was. So I opened this gym in a place, town of maybe 5,000 people, but signed up a couple hundred people in 14 days and we signed up you know, 200K worth of annual revenue and wrote an article about how I did it, what it looked like, and ended up actually getting plastered all over the internet, ended up in Inc. Magazine and uh, people quoted it at Forbes and you know, ended up getting a few million views across here's this. And I wrote this big case study and then led me to doing a bit of consulting for our agency KJ Growth. So started at that point where bit against another bloke for a contract with the University of Delaware. And so he got a digital marketing portion, I got a PR portion. And I had this conversation and I said, okay, cool, what did you do better than me? I pitched for the whole gig, didn't get it. And he pitched the whole gig and didn't get it. And his name turned out to be Jonathan Maxim. And then we came up with a very original marketing agency name called KJ Growth. And so from there, opposed to competing we started that business and that was 2017 and then we're here now from a couple of years on that led me to doing a bit of work with a whole range of types of clients uh, predominantly being a kiwi and working across in the states you get a really good understanding of what scale means when you're talking about millions of dollars of spend when people don't really when you think you've got a really big business when you've started a gym and it's made six figures and you talk about it and they're saying oh you know great you're just getting off the ground and that type of thing there, very, very different understanding of what it looked like. But we're doing a great job with digital marketing for a whole range of clients. Then I had another bloke who I went to university with named Peter. Uh, and he was building up uh, basically an Instagram page of how to be better at goal kicking for rugby. Uh, and again, very, very niche, but jumped on with him and we jumped into Rugby Bricks, which was 2019 when I joined there as a co-founder. And so I've built both those companies up in their time in the interim, but have gone from the whole range of starting with a local community gym through to through our agency working with TikTok and helping them scale internationally. So, so, so let's just reel. yeah, yeah, let's just unpack that in simple terms. So you basically came out of university. The first thing that you did was a gym in Cromwell. You opened mm -hmm. that up with two hundred k of revenue um, from within fourteen days, which is great. Then after that, you started your agency, your digital agency, K and J, and then that yep. led to your first econ business, which is Rugby Bricks. Now, for those of you who don't know what a rugby brick is, I didn't know it by that term, but when you watch the footy and they put a ball down and they do the kickoff, the the plastic yeah, tee, I guess you'd call it, that you put the yeah, ball on, that's, that's a rugby brick. So you have built a multi-million dollar business selling plastic Rugby tees. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow. Talk about a niche, right? That's, that's incredible. Do you, just out of interest, do you sell those just in Australia and New Zealand or do you sell them to NFL and all, all sorts of football around yeah. the world? Uh, so we're a pretty international company now. So the business, obviously, we started the manufactured back home in Dunedin, so yeah. in New Zealand. And we're now at the World Cup, Rugby World Cup. I know it's obviously not unions, are a big thing there in Aussie. 
a lot of leagues over there, but uh, we're over 50% of the players used our products. So pretty big uh, at that there, you know, French team, uh, the Storm use it there. But uh, yeah, largely pretty global everywhere. Anyone who's playing rugby in any of those countries, they're using our products. I don't know. I don't know much about uh, rugby union, but when you're actually in the actual game of rugby union, do they use sand? And are the training bricks are the bricks something that they use for training, or do they use those bricks in match play as well? Yeah, so I'll I'll help clarify a little bit for everyone in terms of what that looks like. So yeah. the plastic molds and the tees, you think about that there. They used to use sand uh, okay. prior to anyone having kicking tees, but the idea of actually digging up and having a sand mound while you're kicking and imagining putting that out while the people are watching you and you've got hundreds of thousands of people watching the game, relatively time-consuming. Right. So they made the kicking tee as a tool for basically the ability for the others just to pop a piece of plastic down and then go through and have a shot at goal. So, Wow. We might, we might get Richard to throw it up in post, um, just a bit of B-roll with rugbybricks.com, uh, rugbybricks.com, <laughs> and have a look at these uh, wonderful contraptions. So let, let's start. Um, I, I want to start, um, I think there's a few lessons here. Let, let's talk quickly about the gym story, how you filled it, and where the origins of your digital marketing came from. But also, I'd like to talk about um, how you did that press release, because I think there's a lot of people listening to this, like, how do you get an article out into the world and get the attention of media? Because I think that would be very helpful for a lot of people listening. So let, let's jump back to the the days of gym. So this is kind of like a, an Alex Hamosi kind of gym launch type of story right yeah right. so so how did yeah. you how did you fill a gym in a little town of cromwell and get 200 people uh from the first two weeks that's an amazing story yeah so going back in my background sort of studied at university and at polytechnic I was personal trainer so i had a diploma in pt and then did biochemistry so those are the the, the core foundations and i had that skill set there and then I think pretty much like any founder or person during that time, which was probably 2008 to maybe 2015, 16, would have picked up the four hour work week. Uh, so Tim Ferriss's book, and there was a real guide and manual for me uh, to say, okay, cool, here's how to build a business. You can do these types of tools and items and go through and, and figure out how to build a business on four hours a week. Now that turned out to be relatively a bit of a lie, but, uh, the idea was there and the seed was planted that I could work four hours a week and never crack at it. And it led me to a blog where he set up this thing, which was, uh, they raised a hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter in 10 days. And so that for me was the first item to start to say, okay, cool. What could I do and how could I apply that to the real world? He used a few tools and the term growth hacking came up a lot in it. But one of the things he did was just went out and pre-sold a water bottle. And I took that for me straight to the gym. So what we did in the town and what it looked like was one, we had this first day period where we literally went through and we said to people, Hey, we're going to open a gym, went out, interviewed people in the town. What do you want to see in it? And we had them to go through and post literally those people we interviewed a Facebook post saying, Hey, these guys are opening a gym. What do you want to see in it? And that was like the first seven days of saying, okay, cool. Here's what we need. This is what the gym needs to look like. And we want it to be 24 seven with this equipment. We held a weekend event where we've had all these people and we grabbed what would be considered small town influences. So the rugby club captain, the local doctor, uh, head of the cycling team and got them to go through and post about us and saying, Hey, these guys are thinking of opening a gym. And then what we did is we were like, sweet, we've got no location. We basically want to figure out because the 80 grand to invest the kit, we just didn't have that money. So what we went and did is bartered with a local landlord and said, mate, we've got an idea. We think we want to have a gym here. We'll sign the lease with you, but what can you do to give us the space free for a weekend? And so had this attention, had this traffic. And what we did is we got people to come to the event on the weekend saying, Hey, all the stuff that you guys said, we had a three and a four pieces of paper, stuck them up on the walls, stuck them on the ground, put them over in counters and said, it's all going to be here. We just need you to sign up beforehand and give you us some money to tell us in advance that when we open, we'll actually be able to go through and make this work. And so we did it. We had that there, set up this event, had all these people come through, sign up, wrote their names on a wall with just chalk to say, yep, they were keen and interested. And so people were walking through saying, ah, oh, cool. I know Craig. I know Michelle. They'd see this. They'd see the A3 and A4 piece of paper, had a couple of couches, 
took down, wrote down their names, had everyone else, and then got them to sign these uh, leaflets saying, hey, cool, hey, when we're open, you signed up and you're coming to the gym. And then we ran that again the following week. And that's how we signed up everyone to the gym. That's amazing. We were talking about something very similar about starting businesses and proof of concept earlier. That That's such an incredible creative way to get proof of concept. We've been banging on about this lately, uh, Kale, you know, a lot about this pre-sell model that's happening in e-commerce quite a lot where people are taking orders for products and then ordering them after they process the sale and making customers wait some time when they start. Some people actually build an actual business model long term off that. But this is a very grassroots guerrilla example of how in a small country town you sort of got buy-in by working with very strategically with the micro influencers in the market but i love the fact that you actually put this is where the machine's going to be and you <laughs> use the chalk on the wall and social proof but this is like analog right social proof right <laughs> yeah. it's it's awesome so with these 200 people how much money did they put down did they put down any money or was it just like my name's in chalk on the wall and that's as good as a handshake in the country yeah, we had a, it's like, there was two things. They they came through and they signed it like, hey, look, we're going to open here and you'd get an annual membership. And that's how we counted them. So we had these 205 people sign up for those memberships, which led to 202K worth of uh, annual memberships. And so they'd just come in, write it on it, date it, and that was it. And then we'd be like, cool, grab the name, email, phone, contact details. And so once they wrote it and said, cool, before one week before we open, we're going to give you a buzz and get you to come through and then sign up for the gym contract. And so that was it. We ended up having, you know, I think, yeah, exactly, 205 um, come through and sign up and do that. Yeah, and how? And so there was no money exchanging hands until the time that it opened. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, and then, yeah, so how did you fund it? Beforehand. How did you fund it? Like, it was 80 grand, right? That's a lot of money for a lot of people listening. Was that just from savings, or how did you actually go, go yeah. and do that? So we went, the first thing was looking at, okay, cool, what do you need? What are we going to do? Because the, the part of fitting out a gym is probably relatively expensive for anyone there, and you've got to refurbish a space and go through that. So three things that we did, and this is with uh, my cousin uh, and his barno, what we looked at is one, where do we get the, the equipment that we think is going to be relatively high quality, but a pretty cheap expense. So first thing we did, got some Chinese content and had a look, had some stuff manufactured there, had seen some other gems using it, and like, sweet, that's our cost. And so we had that reduction of probably, it might have been 50 or 60, and then that left us around 20 to 30 grand to go through and doing it. The cost that we did and how we did it, the whānau, there was two ways. One, uh, the cousins had a trust, and then the second was them putting our own cash and savings into it. The part that we were able to go through and use on the back of it was to get the landlord to say, okay, cool, I can see you guys are going to have a crack here. I'll wait and delay the rent. And that was the other side of that, which yep. was using those peoples and those things. They're like, oh, yeah, cool. I see you guys are going to sign up. I'll let you have the space, and then we'll delay that based on you guys having those numbers and people coming through. And that was the piece that saved us because we would have had to pay for that well before in advance. Yeah, that's a good thing about small towns, right? Like they don't have as much demand for commercial real estate. So when you can see some people having yeah, crap, commercial real estate's not something there. Yeah, and you spend all that. They can see you spending real money. They kind of uh, realize, well, this is a chance of maybe getting a tenant. And Because uh, Dunedin is quite a small town, right? It's not. It's not big at all. Well, this isn't Cromwell, so even smaller. Oh, so, so you're looking at Cromwell, yeah. maybe 5,000 people, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's still in the same place today, down yeah. the mall. Yeah, interesting. Amazing. So that's really cool. So how did you get this publicity? Because this is sort of leading now into your transformation into K KJ, right? So like you're a mm -hmm. digital marketing agency. It's, it's about helping businesses scale through digital marketing. So how, how do you actually go about, you said you wrote a long form essay on the launch, but how does it actually get picked up? Do you release it to, to journalists or like, how do you actually get that traction? Because on your website, you've got some big names and brands that, 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 that have covered your stuff. How, how do you do it? Yeah. So the, what I did is, and if anyone's ever read this, that, that Kickstarter article by Tim Ferriss, the inspiration for me was that he just made it super simple. So very step by step by step. And I'd always thought if I was able to have a crack at starting a business, growing a business, how simple would I make that? And so end up writing, I think maybe it might've been 22 pages worth of, this is what it is, how we did it, what it looked like, uh, and had the proof points. And so I had a friend who wrote for a publication called Influensive, a uh, bloke, Brian Deans, who you guys will probably have a chat with. Uh, he's done some pretty incredible stuff. Uh, he introduced me to him 
an influencer at the time was growing. They were probably getting maybe just over probably a quarter million uh, visits, but they were trying to build a media brand a publication. And he said, mate, we're targeting entrepreneurs. This is not a typical thing that we post, but this type of case study is, you know, really, really credible. Sent it through to him and then he pitched and shared it. And uh, that from there, once it got on that site, blew up. I had, you know, huge amount of founders. I remember getting sort of on the day, like Instagram followers went up by like sort of three, four hundred people. I had random people emailing me being like, oh, I really love this article. It's amazing how you did it. Can we have a chat with you? We come in and have yarn. And so that was the first place where I'd sort of used that as a, a tool. And then from there, uh, that led to a couple of things. One, uh, a writer named Nicholas Cole. Uh, he read it and picked it up and wrote an article around how, what a community can do uh, and placed that in ink. And then from there, the other side of that is that once I had that part in ink, I went out and pitched other journals. So I said, hey, pitch this here. This has had X amount of views. And I think it might have been that stage, maybe a couple hundred thousand. We've been featured in ink. Uh, do you think this might be worth highlighting as a piece in some of your articles around growth and advice for local founders? And so for me, that was a real big part of taking someone else's trust, taking their highlight reel, using that, and then pitching it through. And that's how we end up getting that extra coverage. And for me, led to obviously the first stage of consulting and people saying, okay, cool. Hey, what you've done is pretty incredible. Could you ever crack at doing that for us? Amazing at what one essay can do, eh? Yeah, well, one like, properly researched essay. Yeah. And it is a kind of appealing story, I imagine, because it's kind of like from Cromwell in New Zealand, right? Like it's such a relatable story, you know, like for so many yeah. people. Like if it ha- if it can happen in Cromwell, it can happen anywhere. No offense to Cromwell people. I'm sure it's a lovely <laughs> place, but you know what I mean? Like it's a small Kiwi country town and, and it just proves that entrepreneurship can thrive if you're prepared to do the work and engage with the community. And so I can see why the, the media sort of picked it up, right? It's not, it's, it's like one of our most successful pods was Kenny with the Lego bricks. People loved it because it was um, a story that everybody can relate to. Uh, so w- when you had, um, you know, this essay in hand and the 200,000 followers and a bit of the frame around it, how did you actually reach out to these journalists and how did you know which ones to reach out to? Like, how how do you, do you just send them an email? Do you call them? How do you actually get in contact with them? Yeah, it's quite hard. That was, that started, that's one of the things that I looked at and just Googled how to get PR and found a whole range of things. There was a couple of communities and I think there's a a bloke, Daniel Di Piazza, and he had uh, something, it was a 30 million or a millionaire by under 30, right? And it was a Facebook group. And I sort of asked in that group, hey, does anyone know uh, anyone, uh, any Forbes, Inc., and whatever it was, might have been founder PR stories that I could have a chat with or how you got pitched in them. And so a few people sent me one, like, yep, I write for them. Uh, yes, here, get in contact this way. Or here's what you need to do. And then the first thing that I do- looked at was like, okay, cool. What's the social proof that this article is doing really well? And then how could I use that as a pitch to get into it? So basically what I got told from, and I think I had the chat with Daniel, he said, look, no one really still cares. You're still going to have to do a lot of work because these people are getting pitched day in, day out. Use some social proof to show that it's really, really important. And I don't even think we're calling it social proof at that stage. I think we're in 2017. It was sort of some other term that we were using. But uh, took the highlight reel of what some of the comments were, what people were saying on social media, and then go through. And there was three things that I did. One, got that outreach directly from the people who listen to the Facebook group. Two, Twitter at that time went through and you're able to pitch and send DMs to journos on there. And then the third that you could usually do, which was piece together, and I did this by going and finding on Forbes Inc. the writers who were writing for entrepreneurship and marketing and growth, and then went through. And as soon as I got the first string of someone's email, I would then look at who the author was, and I just append at Forbes.com or at Inc.com, and then send through the pitch, and then whoever answered or replied to me, that's how I ended up going through. So it's a lot of cold outreach for a bit, but... uh, few tactics there that sort of help just hustle like that's just legit hustle and just keep going right what else is there to do in Cromwell (laughs) 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 not a huge amount eh? (laughs) so so go to the gym and annoy journalists what what, (laughs) what do you think or or did they tell you um why they loved it so much like was, was it just a story behind it was it because it was from such a small town was it because it was that guerrilla style 
like, wow, how did you actually do this with no money? Like, what was so... I think it was the... Yeah. Yeah, that, that latter part of... Because the, the title of the article was how we turned $200 into $202,000 in annual revenue in 14 days. And mm-hmm. so if you think about that, it's probably one of the most clickbaity titles you ever get. But when you dived into it, it had literal scripts, screenshots of the people and sent, messages of how people replied. This is what they did. Templates, like here's the spreadsheet and the budget that we used. Here's how we set up email marketing. Mm-hmm. Here's how we set up a shitty free website on Weebly. Like every part of it was pretty easy to see the actual, ah, cool. If someone looks at this, they can do this. And I think that was just a, probably a pretty big indicator for people to say, yeah, you've got a green light to have a crack at this. And this guy's probably some random kid from uh, New Zealand who's emailing me. I'm sure there was some novelty that like the small town bumpkin is like messaging someone in LA or somewhere in the US pitching them being like, hey, I've got this really great story and other people liked it. Please look at it. Over last year, you've watched myself and Eric launch Unemployable, which is this podcast that you see right here now. This has been a really interesting journey and we're starting to really understand and quantify now the value of having a podcast, but it's not what you think it is. When we first started out, we thought, oh, maybe we're going to get you know, money from Google from a number of views that we'll get, or maybe we'll get sponsorship from people who want to you know, sponsor and get access to our audience, but it's none of that. What we've actually learned by doing this podcast now for a year is that the value of it is in the depth of relationship that you build with an audience. Now, the tendency is these days, particularly that we look to these huge podcasts like the Patrick Bet David show or to Joe Rogan or all these other things, and we go, oh my God, they've got like 6 million subscribers or 5 million subscribers. And here we are uh, nearly a year in and we've got like 4,000 subscribers. And it's very easy to go, oh my God, this isn't working. This is a waste of time. But if you stop and think about it for a minute, if you walked into a room where there were 4,000 people in that room, for those of you who know me for a while, the last Reliable Education Summit I did had 2,400 people there at the Brisbane Convention Centre and the atmosphere was electric. Well, now after nine months, 10 months of doing our podcast, we have almost double that as an audience every week that is subscribed. The video is being viewed by way, way more than that. But there's basically an auditorium of 4,000 people there that come and watch our podcast for an hour to an hour and a half, twice a week. So in that time, you create a deep and abiding relationship with those people that generates trust and also transactions ultimately. And over the last year while I've been doing this, from my social media and from YouTube, Eric and I have managed to extract quite a lot of value from the podcast, but not directly. We've started businesses, we've done real estate transactions, we've done a whole bunch of stuff, we've grown our network enormously. In short, a podcast is a phenomenal asset if you're looking to build long-term value into your personal brand or into your business. With that all being said, If you are interested in starting a podcast, two ways you can do it. One, you can do like what you did, and we spent a quarter of a million dollars fitting out this incredible studio here in Southport and sort of taking the plunge. Or two, you could come in and actually use this studio for a fraction of the cost of what it would cost to set up because we are now opening up, the first time ever, five slots for businesses or personal brands, people or companies that want to create their own podcast. You have to come in here, we can rebrand the screens to your branding, all this lighting can be changed in terms of color, it's all LED lit up, and we have a second pod set over to the side there if you don't wanna use the concrete desk, if you want a one-on-one or one-on-two more uh, intimate environment, that's gonna be available as well. Essentially, it's gonna cost around a couple of thousand dollars uh, to come in for a full day with our staff to actually record your podcast. In a day, we reckon if you get organized, you could probably do four long form podcasts, which would give you a podcast release every single week. And then you can cut that pod into short form content to put across your socials and so on. So if that's of interest to you and you'd like to basically leverage the investment that we've made here up front, have access to world-class state-of-the-art facility here in Southport on the Gold Coast and start your own pod for a fraction of what it would cost to do it the way that we did it, then let us know. Just send an email to hello at unemployable.com.au. We're looking for five companies or brands that want to come in for one day a month using our infrastructure, using our team to produce their own podcast and go on this journey as well. All I can say is it's been a hugely rewarding uh, journey. We're not even a year into it and we are continuing to push this on into the future. So hello at 
unemployable.com.au if you'd like to talk to us more about doing it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. I'd love to get a copy of like where that story is published somewhere online, just so that we can share it in the show notes so mm. people can see the full case study and actually get a practical great. example of that. It'd be great because I think it's more than just a puff piece. It's actually providing. And I find myself when I, when you come across a really good case study that breaks you through it, breaks it down for you and steps you through it piece by piece by piece, I can see why that's engaging. And that's what we try to do here on the pod is try to extract, like why I asked, how did you, what were the steps? How did you do it? Because that's what's most helpful. So if you have got somewhere that that's published, that that'd be amazing and we'll pop it in the show notes uh, for, for listeners. Yeah. Sometimes these, these case studies and articles, they're just like actual blueprints and you kind of look at it sometimes and you think, oh, it's just an article, but sometimes it's the key, it's the keys to the castle right there in that blueprint that you put together. You've just got to go out there and execute it, right? Yeah, I saw this. And it, go ahead. I think that big part for me was just the amount of people that sent me emails afterwards or did it, had opened cafes or had opened other gyms or had other, you know, market sort of literally small town sort of businesses that had then popped up as a result of it. Hey, use this and we applied it in our bakery. And I was like, I got a huge range of people emailing me asking for a lot of those things. And it was always the coolest, right? Because they're like, we used, you know, 70% of the article and it really worked. And so I guess that tactical step by step is always something that's been the most useful for me because if you ever read that tim ferris one and link back to that the one that i shared it just was so instructive that for me i think entrepreneurship at least is just avoiding that first part of fear most people don't start because they've got a blank slate in front of them you give people a green light when they've got every part of the instruction to go through and then they actually start to have a crack and that was a really big thing for me and hopefully when i wrote it that it would be that for others it's like baking a cake yeah, I love it. I think it's uh, it's fantastic, and um, uh, yeah, I can I can absolutely see where that worked. Um, all right, so moving on from that, so that sort of led you into KJ, right? So KJ mm. is a digital marketing agency uh, that helps people basically generate more business, right? But th- but now you're doing it in the digital world, so through paid media, correct? Yeah, yeah. That's right. So tell us the story of KJ. Like you like you've got some marquee clients like TikTok and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, who have I got here? Rock Nation, which is Jay Z's company, right? Um, and Monster Energy Group, and the New Zealand government. So, tell us about how KJ got sta- started and what you guys actually do, and then we might dive into how you've worked with TikTok and Rock Nation and what you do for them, and how you can help others. Yeah. So I think going back to the sort of the genesis that, and anyone sort of remembers, there was a term probably and still used but it's just relatively crass and antiquated now growth hacking so anyone who's sort of heard of the author ryan holiday he wrote he writes a whole range of books around stoicism but he did write an initial book called growth hacker marketing and so at the time of sort of 2017 2016 one of the things was just how would you apply growth at a really rapid rate and so an example for anyone who signed up to airbnb early they had these viral campaigns where Essentially, this was one of the first examples of a really big growth hack, which was you sign up, you get free space on for every person that you refer on Dropbox, right? And I think a few of us would have done that. I did it when I was at uni. And they had millions of users by people simply going through. They got another 200 megs, I think, something stupidly small like that for every time that you referred someone. Uh, and that's an example of a growth hack. And so I studied a whole range of those things and I loved it. And so that's how we came up with the first idea of, okay, cool, K and J growth. We weren't very inventive with the name. So it was just myself, Kale, and then Johnny, Maxim, uh, the other bloke who I met and women online, uh, built together and we used it. Okay, cool. We like the idea of uh, K and J growth and we used K and J growth hackers. It's the first term and that's sort of where it started. We met in a Facebook group. So we uh, both wrote for that publication, Influensive, uh, and I'd read a few of his, which was his articles around basically growth hacking what he did he had an app called via which was a fitness app and so we ended up both bidding for that client university of delaware and that's the one that we spoke about which was him going in and saying cool i'll do the digital marketing piece i pitched into the pr i was writing for huffington post at that time and then uh we collaborated on the campaign and then from there we started to build the company and ever since then we took on a whole range of clients and the very first client we had, we absolutely butchered. It was a, another client outside of 
we'd done the University of Delaware and it was another university education client. And we just, they did student signups for their summer camp and we ran all their paid media and marketing, but uh, ended up having to refund them in the end of it because we just couldn't get the numbers. And that was our first client, <laughs> our first case study of how the business started. Mm. Eventually we got better and we figured out what we needed to do, but we were almost to that point where we were cold calling people and then going through and having a chat around getting these students to come through. But that from there and what we're doing now, which has essentially been, look, we found pretty smart, clever ways to take someone on the whole digital customer journey from acquisition, you see a paid ad, you see organic socials, right through to I make a conversion on a website, which is you sign up, you do an app download, you pay money, that type of thing. Okay, so that that's sort of your, your whole offer though, is like you specialize in growth hacking um, and get it, it's performance marketing. So uh, like for TikTok, I imagine they wanted installs. Is that what they wanted? Yeah. So absolutely. they wanted, they wanted ads to get people to, okay, what's this TikTok thing? And they pay you per install or they give you a budget and you try to come in under budget. Yeah, that's it. So and they had basically, that was a large part of, we would do that meet on a performance criteria or do a profit share or some form of, uh, option. Today so, we've got a whole range of things of how we work with clients. How did you get TikTok? Um, were you were you living in New Zealand when this was all going on? So K and J were in New Zealand. You've got the, a website, I imagine. But how did TikTok find you, and how did you sign TikTok up? Yeah, it's a cool story. And uh, one of the things, and people, this is really really interesting. And so for anyone who thinks about the power of SEO being something that is not useful. Uh, this is just the classic story. So we were at that stage, uh, growth hackers, LA. We, and I'm still online, me and John, we had met only once. Um, we'd met online uh, and we'd only worked together online, the business for the first two years, but they found and came through the website via SEO, literally a search submission through, Hey, we were searching for growth hackers in LA. Uh, and they came in as like an actual lead and this is when the company was called Doyon. Um, they hadn't merged with Musical.ly yet to make TikTok. And we got this email and I got the, the reply where I, I was like, oh, I didn't even know what TikTok was at that stage. So they came in as a lead and I replied to them and said, oh, okay, look, hey guys, you know, we typically, when we take on a new client, we look at changing the UX first of the app. So there might be something for you guys to consider, but we'll have a look before we jump on the call. But literally that's how we ended up there was just growth hackers LA. And then that we were the uh, second result, and that's how they submitted the form. So, pretty well. Is that the domain name, Grow Hackers LA? Is that is that what you're saying? Or I think for you, maybe not. Have a look there, but it's we were the the search term there. All oh, right, so you, so you there, ranked super high. high, and so they just yeah. came in as a lead, a, and then you just started talking yeah. to them and said, "All right, so what do you want done?" And how do you engage? So that's it. You just give them a quote and sign them up, and that's it. Yeah, it was sort of really interesting. I sent back that email being like, look guys, you know, I hadn't even looked at the app yet. And I yeah. said, you know, we typically suggest some things around UX and changing behavior first for the world's most addictive and fastest growing app. Yes. Here's That's our, the, here's our humble opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is where you're going wrong TikTok. I should look at. Yes. <laughs> and send that back and then said, look, for user acquisition, we'd have to have a chat. Uh, I ended up jumping on a call with them. Uh, Roxy is still a friend now and she's in LA right now, actually. Um, she's at one of the conventions. Uh, we jumped on a call with her and she said, hey, look, you know, we're testing agencies. We need 10,000 users in a month. Uh, do you think you guys can do it? And we'll pay you uh, 10 USD for uh, every install that you get. And we were like, holy shit, this is going to be massive for us. Uh, and they said, if you can continue to add users at that rate, we'll continue to work with you. And so that was the first conversation. And we ended up taking them on board, obviously, because of that stage, like for us, we had cracked six figures as a business but we would definitely know we near a seven figure business. So, so you, uh, so they yeah. give you $10 an install and then you guys go and buy traffic and build landing pages or whatever. They don't really care. They're just paying for an outcome. They just didn't get it. They're just like, look, as long as you can get a confirmed install with D1 retention, at, I think we can't remember what percentage it was. So D1 for anyone who's listening, just day one, they come back to the app after installing on the first day and then D30, they had a percentage target for that. Uh, that's all they care about was like, if you can get us that, anything you get in between them is margin yours to keep. Right. And so we were blown away at that stage. We we're like, we're going to be multi-millionaires on this. And how much Definitely were you able to get in, how much were you able to get installs for and, and how did you get those installs? 
Yeah, so we had 30 days to hit these campaign numbers, uh, and we absolutely butchered the first 27 days. Uh, we like scrambled, we tried everything, we just <laughs> built landing pages, paid media, we were using paid ads, and people just were not signing up. We were paying probably 14, 15 bucks for an install, and we were like shitting ourselves. We we're like, okay, this is not good because they'd forwarded us some of the money as well. And so <laughs> we like, we need that for paid media, and we were like, fuck, we're not going to get this over the line. And came to i think yeah maybe day 27 28 one of the things that we'd seen and instagram hadn't done this yet was that you could set up our uh, direct de- so dms from influencers you didn't have that sequence for them to send it out w- automate it uh, and there was a whole thing like mini chat and some of those tools what we did is we started off and we were like okay fuck we need to figure out another way we had a friend who had a relatively big account and what we did is we got them to film the first half of their content so sending them being like hey i'm on tiktok here's this first half of this piece of the content if you want to see the rest of it go sign up to tiktok and so we had basically started to enlist influencers and get them to do these first five to ten second clips that they auto dm'd and we built the software so they could send it out to their followers on ig and they're like 10 seconds the rest is on tiktok and then we scaled that and just recruited a shitload of influencers and then paid them to send them out that messaging and we got them to do and create the content and we still delivered late i think we were like we had 30 days and they gave us 40. we ended up delivering the installs and scaling it out across i think it might have been i can't even remember maybe 200 300 influencers uh in the space of using that to auto dm half of this content and then have the rest on tiktok and you were able to make margin there pretty significant margin at that stage because all we had to pay for software and then recruiting the influencer uh, but even at that stage micro influencers like you just weren't paying a lot for them and then the idea of them DMing and saying, hey, you're going to work on this new platform was a pretty cool one. So that's interesting. Interesting. So these were very, these are some of the first TikTok people, really, I guess, at that time yep. that you were working with. Yeah. yeah. And so they were getting the payoff yep. of working so close to the, the lava flow, so to speak, of, of TikTok itself. And probably were getting a bit of love from the algorithm as well uh, once they got going on TikTok because they were so early. So, so how many? Yeah, well, the other thing too. Yeah, they were, they were sending their own users there, right? Yeah. So people that were following them on Instagram, and you can imagine getting a, I don't know how many, like if you have followed, I doubt The Rock is a good example, but someone that you really love on Instagram, if Tim Ferriss sent me a message directly to my inbox saying, hey, I'm testing a new platform. Here's the first 10 seconds of this content. Jump across this other platform to watch the rest of it. There's just no, there's, like if he sent me that, I'd cut you sweet following you. See you in a minute. Like that was a really big part to get people across. And you got software that did that for them. So the software went through their DMs and invited them, showed them the first bit. And then, so you're basically raping and pillaging Instagram. <laughs> 100% for users for TikTok. <laughs> I'm sure many, Instagram yeah. was wrapped. How many installs did you guys manage to get? We got in that first period, it was probably 12, 13,000. Uh, and they asked if we could continue to scale it up and out. And then we started to figure out, okay, cool. How could we do this with paid media? Uh, and we had a whole campaign, like that's what built us to a seven figure business. Uh, it was on the back of running these campaigns for TikTok. So you basically only fans them. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what they do on Instagram, isn't it? You're like, Hey, see the left one. And if you go over to TikTok, I'll show you the right one. <laughs> you know? like, and they look very it. different. <laughs> a little higher brow than that, but... <laughs> So well, you, I mean, it's pretty basic. So you you went from a six figure business to a seven figure business just on the back of the strategy, but on that strategy. But we also got then start to figure out paid media as well. Yeah. So we could then start to use okay, cool, because we had that time frame, and we were running shit ads. They just didn't work at that stage, and so yep. we just didn't really have that time frame to figure it out comparatively to once we'd actually got this strategy. And they said, "Sweet, well, we'll continue to pay you at that rate for these installs, and can you do it for the rest of the world?" We were like, sweet, we'll give the time. And they gave us, because there was probably, I think maybe that stage, they said they had 30 agencies and they kept five of us on. Wow. So we were able to just be like, sweet. And they trusted us from there. Yeah. So we then got that time to actually have it, to figure it out. What year was it? gave us the ability to actually put paid ads in. What year did this start? Was 2000 and, where are we now? 16, 19. 19. And how long did that gravy train last? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> about just over a year. So it's okay. pretty cool. Uh, but TikTok, and this is uh, ByteDance, the parent company, just a really awesome company in terms of taking learnings and applying them. 
So they were very, very effective around what are you doing? How are you doing it? What does that learning look like? And then there was a whole range of stuff that immediately once we'd implemented, they would go through and then use that as well. Mm. Do it themselves. Yep, 100%. Yeah. The Chinese don't usually copy things, so that's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange, eh? <laughs> so let's let's uh, so let's change gears to Rock Nation. How did that come about? Jay Z, Hove, yeah. what were you doing for Rock Nation? Yeah, so this was a, a an NFT project. Uh, okay. They wanted to do a crossover with. So we had the essentially Stan Lee Estate, and then Rock Nation. We're going to bring to market these unique NFTs of some of the original comics of what they had. And so Rock Nation was just getting into the game of what does NFT marketing look like? How do we bring some of these collections to the market? And this came from another platform. We were pretty big in Web3 working alongside some crypto clients uh, and uh, a platform called Nifter. And so they'd had access to this memorabilia and assets. And so they were like, great, we want to figure out what that looks like. And the promotion angle was if you guys can do it with some of the Stan Lee stuff, we'll work with that and then make sure that we can apply that with Rock Nation. <laughs> and so that was our first foray into, I guess, one, looking at what a channel and platform was. Rock Nation wanted to understand how NFTs work, what that was, and then the deal of what this other side was, the Stan Lee estate, we had access to some of the IP around there and then turning those into NFTs. So what was the Stan Lee estate? What were the assets inside of the Stan Lee estate like, that we would know? Uh, the original, the, uh, the, I think the first Fantastic Spider-Man one. Okay. You guys know that iconic cover of him swinging out okay. and okay. holding one person. So that's an example of what some of those comics were. It sounds like you guys like it. Is he a Kiwi as well, your business partner? Nah, it's a US bot. So it looks there, he was in, yep. Sounds like US a t- couple of guys that just had a red hot crack and just said yes to everything and figured it out as you went along sort of thing. Is that... I mean, it's such a great entrepreneurial trait, but most people don't start anything until they got all the answers. But with TikTok, you're like, all right, yes, we'll do it, $10. And then you were losing money, and then you sat down with three days to go and thought, fuck, we better... It sounds like Flight of the Concords, is it? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, building, I'm uh, building the parachute, eh? No, but talk about building, like, no idea, really. I mean, I love this, because you're just like, we'll have a crack, we'll figure it out, and you did. And then TikTok led to Rock Nation... You know, which which led to NFTs, which ultimately was pretty much a dumpster fire. But it was still, yep. a, at the time, it was a lot of learnings, right? Like, it's really interesting. So you built the agency. So K and J, how big did K and J get? You've still got it now, right? So it's still still yeah. there. Is it is it morphed at all? Is it still sort of a shop where you turn up and say, I want app installs or I want X result. Here's my budget, and you arbitrage the difference, or are you more of a traditional? you know, retainer-based, spend-based agency now? Mm, we've definitely gone closer to the latter. And the biggest we got to was uh, around about that would have uh, would have been, I don't know what that would be in Aussie, but four and a half mil um, around that area. Yeah, that mark was the biggest we got. One of the things that, and now we use it predominantly more for largely working one with the clients that we like and two, to produce probably more sustainable income and the issue with that, when we got to the peak of our growth, we just weren't very good managers. So the business at its size and its stage, when it got to the, the highest revenue, we had people hiring other people. And it, the business had probably, I think it was peak 28-ish people. And on the back of, you know, 4 4.8, 3.5 mil revenue, just wasn't that good. Had a lot of people who were in effect at their jobs. And we were trying to get to, how do we step ourselves out of the business? But in reality, what we were doing was just adding a lot of people who didn't actually know what they were doing yeah. uh, by us not having really strong leadership. And so the business that it works and the function is that we've reduced the core teams down to, I think it's probably about 12, 13 of us now, and focused on what's high profitability, what are clients that we want to work with, and then using it as an opportunity to take equity inside of other businesses. We work with startups who come through and saying, look, can't afford to buy it or hire you guys at this stage, but we take some sweat equity, we have some issue areas in that, or the second, which is big clients like a New Zealand government, MB, take on relatively large contracts for that and, and use it on there. But again, choosing more of the projects that we've got now as a result of the work that we've done in the past. Have any of those worked out for you from an equity point of view out of interest? Because I imagine that's sort of a bit of a crapshoot, right? Like you got all these, you know, entrepreneurs that have got no cash and full of ideas and 
enthusiasm, but like you, you invest real time and energy. Is there, have you got any case studies where you took someone on and it's it, you know it scaled and exited, or it's a highly profitable business today, or are you still in that sort of stage of like we've got a portfolio of possibilities? Like I did three investments ten years ago with Tim Ferriss, and of those three, two have completely failed, and one I think is hanging on by a thin thread. <laughs> It's a, it's a really, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a really, uh, like the first investment Tim did was with a company called Ship, S-H-Y-P, and it went to Ship. But um, yeah, what's been your experience? <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of those is Rugby Bricks, right? So that's okay. an example where I took a fair bit of equity in that business, but I'm a managing director in that business now. I'm leaving the growth of it. So I can't really say that was a, it was a definitely a sweet equity exchange and they got access to K&J, but uh that was more of me now leading and building a business. But out of, I think, probably got maybe seven or eight, and one has gone well. They're called Pay Hippo. I have a look at them. They're just a fintech company. They have done lending in Nigeria. So, yeah, no is the answer so far. But largely, I'm trying to find bets that are good founders and people that I think are going to crack for a longer term. So the bricks, the, the, the rugby bricks, which we'll get to in a minute, that's somebody else came to you and pitched that and said, we need help with our marketing, and you took equity in it. Is that how that worked? Mm, sort of. I yeah. had the one of them. So influence of that first company that I was writing for, and I was doing the case study where I put the two hundred to two hundred two k in there. I pitched Pete and I said, "Look, can I write an article about rugby bricks because I love rugby?" And you built a business. He'd done maybe eighty grand at the stage on just a kicking tee, and like it was a Weebly website. And I was like, "How the fuck are you even making money?" That for me was sort of mind blowing because it was just so shit. The website took maybe like six to seven seconds to load. And I was like, how is this even, what are you doing that's different, right? And he had maybe 40,000 followers on Instagram. And I went to him and was like, bro, can I write an article about this? Uh, and then that led to, he's like, yep. And then I said, look, here's all the stuff you're doing wrong. And this is what I think you can do right. And he's like, oh, do you want to be, I would send you the business. I was like, yeah, yeah sweet. What was the headline of that article? How a dog shit website made a <laughs> more successful anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, still yeah. can't, I, I still can't believe this rugby bricks thing. Like it's nuts. Is there, is it because there wasn't much competition or you don't have much competition or like, I, I just can't yeah. see how something like this could be a seven fact, figure. Like you were saying off camera, I think you said it was a $2 million a year business. Is that accurate? That's what we did last year. So about 1.8. Is, is this, is this USD or is this New Zealand NZD. or Aussie? NZD. NZ. Yeah. yeah. That's nearly 40 grand a week of Oh, a week of uh, kicking bricks. Like, it's just like... <laughs> yeah, kitchen teeth. I mean, how often yeah, do these yeah. things break? Right? And what's what's your like average order value on a site like that? Yeah, right now it's gone up. So we're like 74. But uh, previously it was, would have been people were buying one tea and they were getting the shipping costs at maybe $48, $49 a lot of tea. I suppose when you think about it though, right? Like you got... It's a big sport. And so there's like... There's, there's kids yeah. games and there's trainings and there's... People who want to practice, you know, that are aspiring, you know, um, you know, footy yep. players all over the world that need it. So I, I get it. It's just, not, it's just not one of those obvious things. It's like when you started fight, you know, yep. um, Kale uh, Eric's has a company called MX Store, which is a motocross store that does, you know, hundred million a year. But he started another brand which is called Fight Store, Fight HQ, Fight HQ. Sorry, yep. and and like I look at, you know, some of the like how many how many SKUs do you have in Fight HQ? Uh, off the top of my head, I think we got about 5,000. Now, would you think there are 5,000 different SKUs for a website that sells fight gear? Yeah. Like once you run out of mouth guards, hand yeah. wraps, boxing gloves. We're, we're, adding, we're adding 50 SKUs a week. Yeah, adding 50 SKUs a week. Yeah. It's just one of those things you just never think there's that much there. And yeah. it's about to become an eight-figure business this year, I believe. Yeah. It's just mind-blowing. And, and here you are selling kicking tees, bro. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seriously for everyone listening here's a dude from like cromwell in new zealand that's doing two million dollars a year selling kicking tees what's your bloody excuse like seriously it's so incredible. when you when you did the deal with them and came in to the business did you was it kind of was it an aha moment going wow this guy's doing 80 grand in business and he's got a shit website doesn't know what he's doing there's a massive opportunity here is that kind of how yeah, your, your, your thinking was? Did you realize that this thing yeah. could be a $2 million business selling kicking tees? Maybe not to the extent, cause we, we, and we're growing now at this next phase. Like we're, 
we've been doubling year on year, right? And so the goal for us again, we'll double this year and we're going to a, to apparel. So the kit that you see players running out in, the Asics, the uh, Classic, all of those types of brands, we're going into that now. But the when I started, one of the things that I looked at, and for anyone who's done this, but you can just call, it's called Meta Pixel Helper or Facebook Pixel Helper. It's just a Google Chrome extension. We can go to a website and see if someone's got a, a Facebook Pixel. And so... Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the pod. I wanted to share a really interesting stat with you. In our e-commerce business, where we sell electric toilets, we noticed that nearly half of our online visitors visit our website and do their research outside of normal business hours. Now, when you think about spending thousands of dollars a month on traffic, it is pretty important that you can service your customers when they're on their website. And that's why we used Early Bird AI, that's E-A-R-L-I rather than Y, earlybird.ai. The team there helped us implement AI-powered web forms, which when somebody has a question about anything to do with our product, our website actually texts them immediately and engages with them in a discussion to assist them with whatever they want to know and is trained to move them towards purchase. We've also installed a talking website where it's about to go live where you can literally push a button on the website and it connects with an AI-powered voice that sounds like a natural Aussie-speaking person and you can literally just talk to the screen and have the AI engage with them, answer all their questions and again, direct them towards a sale. If you would like to learn other ways, including those, to grow your business through very smart AI, go and talk to the people at earlybird.ai. You can get a free audit of your business. It's not just for online businesses. We're working with plumbers, medical centers, all kinds of businesses over there. Go to earlybird.ai. I can't recommend them highly enough. With that said, enjoy the rest of the pod. What it did when I, he sort of showed me the site, so I was like, okay, cool. You're not tracking anything. People are literally having to go like arduously fight through your website to buy your shit product, like the product in terms of like, this is a shit fight to get there. Product's fantastic, but God, it was a lot of work for someone to go through and buy it. And then I went and looked at all the other competition for rugby. And so brands like you guys might've heard of for League, Steden, uh, yep. Gilbert, all of those companies started going and looking at the rugby competition and like none of them had pixels installed on their website. And then I was like, oh, this is going to be like taking candy from a baby. These people suck. And so I went to start to have a look around the content, everything from there just started screaming out to me. And I was like, there's a reason Pete's doing really well is one, if anyone who's played rugby union or even league, a lot of the detail you've ever not gone to the professional game it's left to the very much end until like you played premier rugby and then you make that jump to professional that gap between the level of coaching was just not publicly shown people had no idea it's really common in the nba now where you see people teach those things and they've been doing that for the last 10 years but it just didn't exist in rugby and so i went through and i started looking at all these other brands that sold rugby products and just none of them websites sucked search console like i was going through looking at keywords people went by google ads and i was like holy shit <laughs> there's a huge opportunity here and so then i went to pete and i was like look bro you guys kind of would hire us but how about you and i i'll come in be essentially a co-founder take a relatively large chunk of equity and let's go through and build this together uh, do you mind me asking how much equity you did take 24 percent is how i initially started with yeah, yeah. So you took Still, 20 years built it more yeah. since then. Still. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason I ask is because so often people are like, "Oh, I don't want to give up equity," but in your case, you took it from eighty thousand to two million. So you like, yeah. you know, that's a twenty x. So to give up twenty five percent on a twenty x is smart business because that's a much bigger pie than what it was beforehand. So if you get the right person, and I just want to just recap what Kale just said because. It was said really calmly and whatever, but there's actually a real gold nugget there. Like it, 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 this is a classic boring business. Like I always joke, I like long romantic walks to the bank. I don't give a shit how sexy a business is. What's romantic, <laughs> what's romantic to me is making money. And so you've got this boring business that sells rugby bricks or rugby. Are they called rugby bricks or rugby tees? It, nah, so the, the kicking tees, the kicking companies, tees. we're called rugby bricks because basically we're building the bricks and the foundations of a home for learning how to play rugby. Right? Okay. And so if you think about it in that light, we're making those foundations. And then the things that we sell are our kicking tees, so a Vortex, an RP88, a whole range of tee names and that sort of stuff. But yeah, things that refer to them, and you haven't heard them, as rugby bricks. 
Right, right, yeah. Because I thought if it was if they were called rugby bricks, you've obviously got to kill a domain as well. But what you said was you you use that Meta tool, Meta Pixel, which enable which is a Chrome plugin that enables you to see whether the website selling the thing has a Meta or Facebook Pixel installed, which tells you by extension whether they're doing any Facebook retargeting and marketing. And then you just went yep. to the AdWords tool and had a look at how how many people were searching for these things and who was advertising on those keywords. And and by deduction, you were able to say, this is a very, very poorly marketed to area of the internet. And there's not a lot of places that are obvious where there's large pools of search and interest and people coalescing around a sport or an idea or an interest that are underserviced in that respect. And so with I've got a, a business where we sell electric toilets, like camping toilets. And um, that was the same thing before I decided to take it on i did that kind of work so through deduction how much search volume is there how competitive is it how good are the other marketers in that area of the jungle and i came to the same conclusion that there's very few people that are focused exclusively on that niche of camping there's people who are general on camping like an eric type of site where a camping toilet is one of five thousand SKUs, mm-hmm. but nobody had a was a specialist in that area and you are a specialist in the kicking T market or the rugby T market, uh, which enables you to build a $2 million business and you're 20 X. So for everybody listening here, when people say, I've got no money, I've got no money. If you're a young person, you are a billionaire with time. You have a billionaire of minutes and through studying podcasts like this and listening to people like Kale and reading books by Tim Ferriss and others and consuming information, you can turn that superior knowledge into meaningful equity in a multi-million dollar business and and kale you could have you know probably done five of these in the last couple of years if you'd made it your focus of you know using your skill set to help founders grow and you could have even done it on a risk basis where you say i'll take 50 percent, but only kicks in when i quadruple your business right uh mm. that's a that's a, a zero zero lose situation for somebody who doesn't know digital marketing right it seems to be a pretty yeah. common theme. Sorry, Kale. I was just going to say, there seems to be a pretty common theme as well. Like, it's not like you've had multiple years of experience on this one strategy and then you're implementing that strategy across multiple businesses. You're literally learning where the market is at that time, finding out what works and then implementing what works at the time, right? Like it's an ever evolving business. E-commerce is ever evolving. You're just willing to get out there and learn what works. Yeah, and I think that's it. And I think I'll, for no, any founders who do want that offer, feel free to reach out now. Uh, more than happy to to have that equity conversation if you want it. Um, <laughs> but the <laughs> the other side of that, which is we've basically, and for me, this has been a culture of learning. But I just hang out with smarter people. So typically, like this, jumping on podcasts with you guys, it's a good chance after this, I'll get it one the connection, but two, continue to learn from you. And each of the businesses, as they've iterated or found some of these competitions and holes, one, they're super niche. And I think that's for anyone. They're a simple business. We had one, ski, like at that stage, Pete was just producing world-class product, like was one kicking tee. He'd sold it for, you know, been making $80,000 of sales in that. But it's a super simple business. Just keep making the same content that's really doing really well, figure out how to make it better, and then add slightly a couple more SKUs. The predominantly what we do, we have, I think, maybe now, 40-ish SKUs, maybe a bit less. And we're still scaling and growing on that. But that's a simple, super niche and very low competition where we could find relatively high profitability and growth. And so the ability to iterate and then hang out with people smarter than me, just asking good questions has been our pathway to growth. Where where do you see this business going? Like how, how big do you think it can actually get relative to the, to the size of the market? Yeah, there's a couple of things that I've looked at for how I think we could do this. One is you could keep growing the people that play the game. So you could get more people to play rugby, right? Which is then growing an entire industry. I definitely want to do that. I like rugby. It was a great sport for me growing up and it was a really good way to connect and play a great game where you just hang out with good blokes and usually it turns into a bit of a good time, have a few beers, but really cool thing to socialize on. And so there's the growing the game. And then the second part, which is, well, how do you bring out another skew where you put yourself into a more crowded market but you already have an advantage because you've got you know we're seventy five thousand plus customers now that we can then start to leverage that and so we've gone into club wear now 
which is basically leveraging that customer base that we've got and saying, okay, great, hey, we can build out and look after your entire team's kit. Because if we look at the segment for rugby, there's probably about 10 million people that pay. And then out of that, 10 to 15% of people are goal kickers. So the market about 1.5 million. Mm. Now, if we were to look after everybody and an entire market, well, then there's now a market of 10 million people. And so for us, that's the next stage of where we hit it, which is how do we build and put club kit on 10 million people? And for us, the goal is just to continue doubling. So we want to get to 20 mil by the next World Cup or the Rugby World Cup, which is 2027. So the goal for us is just following that phase. At that stage, as a founder, I'm not sure particularly if I want to go through and try and build a nine-figure business. Uh, I think for us as a business at that stage, we love rugby and me and Pete. We love building and doing these types of things and creating world-class product for rugby players. But I'm not sure personally what it looks like. could be a nine-figure business, and I think we can build it to that. But I just don't know if that's the decision that we want to make. It's 75,000 customers yeah. for kicking tees. It's just bananas. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm really stoked for you, and I love... Look, I, I love this interview for a number of reasons because it's 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 really a hustle story, right? Like you've come from a small town and you've just grafted your way out of it, you know, like you've just found a way to get yourself into deals and learn as you go and not know everything but take on projects and give it a red hot shot. And it's it's just such a good story of hustle, you know, like it, you know, I, I just, I, I hope for it, no matter where you're listening to this, our pod gets listened to with people who are flying between Sydney and Bali and, you know, going on a holiday on the aeroplane right now or they're on a train or they're driving, uh, you know, to or from a job they don't like. This is just a really good, uh, encouraging story of a quietly spoken dude um, just finding a way out through just thinking and creating. And, uh, you know, I can't imagine someone like you with your brain being in a town like Cromwell. It would have been a fairly lonely existence you know, there wouldn't have been too many entrepreneurs, but now you're downtown LA, you've got, you know, business and clients there and um, you're just, I, I can see probably that you'll build out a portfolio of, of companies like Rugby Bricks and it would be an exciting future for you. Um, yeah. Where does, where does the the mindset come from? Just obviously coming from, from a, um, you know, um, benefit housing to, you know, just that, is that where it came from? Just being scrappy, that hustle, kind of trying to get out of the out of that rat race. Where, where does that mindset come from, and how do you how do you sustain it? Having you know one one out of six, for instance, that's actually done something in regards to um, investments that you've put you know sweat sweat equity in. Mm. I think so. Coming back to you know, and this is hopefully, and I don't know because I, I, when. We grew up in a household like this. This wasn't the type of stuff we consumed, right? You usually be sitting in front of a TV and uh, there was just alcoholism, sort of domestic violence, that type of stuff. Mm. But if you hand in, you pick this, pick this up. One of the things is, I mentioned it before, but you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And so I got very lucky when we moved from uh, Brisbane where we'd missed a shitload of school, maybe a year's worth of school. And it became to the point where SIFs are turning up at the door, having a knock in and saying, look, you know, kids aren't coming to school, we're going to be get taken off here. To go into a place like Clyde, which is very small rural town, biggest thing is I was able to go to school. And so started hanging out with other people who it was really normal for them to go to school every day. All right? And that's been something that I looked at there for a very long time is if I hang out with people that are smarter than me and I'm the fifth in the room in terms of the poorest or in this case wanting to become you know an eight-figure founder and I'm a seven-figure founder, I'm going to pick up what they do, their habits through osmosis. And it was the same at school. I just had friends who studied and did their homework. They read every day. Their parents, you know, they, one of the things I always found sort of mind blowing, and I had this pretty early on, went around to a friend's house and it was, we'd had dinner and I was probably 13, 14 and his mum was cooking and it sort of it was weird. I was looking there, I was like, oh, does your mum, does, does she not have a glass of wine? And he's like, oh, no, like, she might have that on maybe on Friday or maybe on the weekend. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> this is not how everyone does. Like not everyone's steamed by like two, 3 PM in the afternoon, uh, which was the norm in my household. Right. And you start to figure out some of these things, which is as you go through and you start hanging around with other people, 
okay, cool. Oh, you manage your team like this. What does that look like, right? Oh, you see how great founders do this. That's what a good system looks like. And so for me, uh, basically digitally, I hung out with a lot of really smart people. A Tim Ferriss, you know, a Ryan Holiday, a Grant Cardone, you know, all these people were my inspiration online. And I just spent a lot of time online learning and picking up those things there. And then I just started to read books and biographies of, cool, for one of the things and you pick up in a book and something like a Charlie Munger, you know, uh, read something like Titan by John D. Rock or about John D. Rockefeller. You get to have these intimate conversations with these people and all you do is absorb and learn. And so the mindset for me, which has been here, is just that if you can physically hang around with people that are smarter and better than you. And then if you can't, figure out how to do that same thing digitally so that most of the time you have an inclination to want to learn because then you start to get inspiration of shit someone else has done it this is what it is that person was poor maybe i could have a crack at this too so that's been a big drive for me great advice i I was i was just going to say you know congratulations on on all your achievements and and congratulations on your humility because that's obviously a big part of your success that i can see and you know, rightfully so, a lot of people that grow up in, in more difficult households have, have, can have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because of what they've grown up with. But for you, it's, you, you seem to have been able to either find the positive or, or, um, yeah, just, just being able to create a sense of humility about yourself that we can feel even, even across, um, across the internet connection here. So no doubt that's, that's a huge part of your success. And I just want to say congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. It's been great having you. Um, it's it's a different interview to some of the ones we've done uh, because it's like my career. My career is sort of quite scrappy. You know, I've tried so many different things because all I knew is I didn't want to be poor. You know, I came from a very working class family. I wanted options and um, I came from Brown's Plains. I didn't have alcoholism or domestic violence, but, you know, I didn't come up with much either. So I totally relate to that story. And for the, for the young person listening to this that may be trapped in that cer, 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 uh, set of circumstances, maybe you're geographically in a place that's low socioeconomic, you know, there's a th- the, where domestic violence, alcoholism, those things are common, um, and just people are doing it tough. I know what it's like to be there as well. Um, and we had AJ here the other day who, from Revel Saunas, same sort of thing, you know, was abandoned at age 14 and, and now is a multi-billionaire. Um, there's two books I'd recommend that really were impactful for me at that time. One was called The Magic of Thinking Big by David Swartz. It's a really wonderful book for um, for young people who've never, never had anybody whisper in their ear anything positive, like, you can do anything, Kale. You know that there's a big world out there, mate. You're not always going to live here in New Zealand. You can go on and you can do deals with some of the biggest companies in the world and make millions of dollars in your businesses. Sometimes the quiet whisper in a child's ear from the right person at the right time can be absolutely life-changing. And that quiet whisper can come from a book or it can come from a podcast or it could be this moment where... You hear us saying to you, all of us have been successful in business and we want you to know as you're sitting there listening right now, we believe in you and um, yeah, you, you can change it. And that's the beautiful thing about being a human. And the other book that I wanted to recommend is uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the reason that book is so important is because quite often the key to your better future is people. It is that one person that gives you a chance to come and work under them for free or will sit down and have a coffee and perhaps be that voice of positivity and hope in your life. And I didn't know how to win friends and influence people. You know, um, all I'd figured out because I was bullied so badly as a child because of my teeth and my bad haircut and shitty clothes and hand-me-downs was how to make people laugh because it took the attention of everything else, you know. Um, that was sort of learning to win friends and influence people. So if you're a young person, you don't know how to do that. Don't be ashamed. But I can tell you right now that like, uh, in the, in the famous words of, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction, a dog's got a personality and a personality goes a long way (laughs) for those of you who know the line, right? So, uh, (laughs) if you've got a personality and you know how to talk to people and you know how to look someone in the eye, you can have no money and you can have no commercial power 
in your life. But if you know how to win friends and influence people, it could be life changing. One of my good friends runs Porsche here on the Gold Coast. He's the dealer principal and part owner of Porsche Range Rover, uh, you know, the, the premier dealerships here. And he started washing cars, but he learned to win friends and influence people. And now his business partner is one of the wealthiest guys in Australia. And, um, and, but he started from absolutely nothing. So no matter where this is, um, hear these words and, and listen to Kale, who's sitting there uh, today. If you're listening on Spotify, Kale's sitting in downtown Los Angeles, where he's joining us from. And for some of you, that's going to sound like such a world away from where you are, but it is possible. And he's there and he's got businesses and he's here talking to us. So just believe in, 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 in the beauty of life because it, it can change so dramatically and there's never, ever been a time in history before this where you have more, you know, you, you have so much access to pods like this, to hearing what Elon Musk thinks about the world. When we were coming up, none of this was as, as accessible. So you live in an extraordinary time and it's all waiting for you. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes we can, we can have people on the pod that have got these real hard luck stories and we say, oh, you know, if, if this guy can do it, there's no excuses for the people watching at home. But, you know, we all, I think we also understand that it doesn't matter how you grew up, you can be going through a difficult time where you, where you lack that little bit of belief in yourself. Even if you grew up in a loving household, it's still possible to be going through that difficult time. So you know, to, to your words, Adam, no matter where you at and, and no matter what you've been through, even if you don't think you've been through that terrible of an upbringing, we understand that it gets difficult at times, but you can turn it around. Yeah. And it's okay. It's one, okay. It's one, okay. One of the worst parts is when you don't have a right looking from the outside. I got friends who are, um, who are just finding themselves in a spot in their life where they're very flat. And then I talk to them and, and I say, how are you feeling? And they're like, well, I'm, I'm kind of borderline depressed. And the worst part is I know I've got no excuse to be depressed. Mm. The family is okay. There's money in the bank. And then it makes it worse because you know you don't have the right to it, but it's still okay to feel that way. It's just part of life and, and uh, so on. So with that said, Kale, thank you for joining us, mate, and for contributing your wisdom and experience and journey and sharing it with us so openly. It's been a really wonderful story and um, we, we can't wait to watch uh, Rugby Bricks kick some goals. Ba-boom. Uh, <laughs> ba -boom. How do uh, people get in contact with you, Kel? They want to hear more about your story or have any questions? Yeah, so look, uh, LinkedIn's the best place for me. I usually spend a, bit of, a fair bit of time on there. Uh, I'm lucky I'm the only Kale plan all in the world, so just <laughs> A-A-L-E. Wasn't a the spectacularly super food either at that stage. So just <laughs> uh, and then... Bart Hall's the last name, so P A N O H O. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, and then uh, from there, it's pretty easy to get a hold of me. So, I kind of feel left out not being on LinkedIn and working LinkedIn because a lot of there's yeah. uh, there's a uh, common theme with a lot of our guests. It's like, where do you get in contact? Uh, I'm thinking, you know, Instagram and TikTok, and they're like, oh, LinkedIn, interesting. LinkedIn would suit you, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I've never been on LinkedIn either. I, I only just joined the other day, so I could finally, when people send me their LinkedIn profile, I could actually see it. Because those bastards oh, don't let you see anything out. unless you're a member. Yeah, I've got to get on there. Yeah. So, uh, so cool. yeah. Hell of a platform. Kale, thanks, mate. Let's uh, let's talk again as you uh, march on into the future and take more equity and, and grow more companies. And and uh, and we wish you all the best in your journey towards the eight-figure mark with your business. I'm sure it'll happen. Let us know when it does, and we'll let the community know as well, and we'll raise a glass to you. Yeah. Brilliant. All right, guys. Thanks, 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 Cal. thanks for watching. As always, guys, we want to thank our sponsor, Early Bird AI. That's E A R L I, Early Bird. Um, go to earlybird.ai and they will help you out. They're terrific guys. They're doing great things and we'd love uh, for them to uh, continue to grow. So, thank you for watching, guys. And as always, please drop a comment. Let us know what did you think of this podcast. Kale will no doubt read them. Um, so, give him some positive feedback. Let him know what you guys think. And, um, We'll see you on the next podcast. Bye for now and thanks for watching. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.